Dream Chronicles Fiction The Apostle of Insanity Trilogy Volume 2 Frenzy by John Allen Price Chapter 6 All right, here it comes, warned Miranda Jackson when a familiar, innocuous-looking smudge appeared at the top of her screen. I'm initiating enhancement. Corporal, you better go get the colonel. While well, one of the enlisted staff slipped out of the strategic reconnaissance office for the nearby crash quarters, Jackson programmed her console to magnify the smudge until it nearly filled the screen. Weber repeated the same procedure at his radar imaging station, and by the time both were nearly finished, Colonel Torin staggered back into his command. This had better be good to interrupt the dream I was having, said Torin, yawning and still rubbing the sleep from his eyes. What do you have, Captain? Latest images of Base Aquila, said Jackson. And as expected, all those helicopters are gone. Well, they certainly didn't take off, or our long-range surveillance radar would have detected that. Lieutenant, they still there? Yes, sir. They're sitting in rows along the airfield perimeter, Weber answered. Let me match the magnification scale, and I'll transfer this to Miranda's console. Moments later, the black and white image, almost identical to what Jackson had on her screen, appeared on it in an insert frame. Its chief differences were the lack of obscuring clouds and concealing vegetation. With the stroke of a few keys, Jackson had the radar image enlarged and superimposed over her original optical one. And clearly seen along the airfield's jungle perimeter, were single rows of Python and Long Rider helicopters, hidden from the optical surveillance by camouflage nets. The Oracle satellite's side-looking radar easily scanned through the artificial canopies. That's almost all of them, said Torin, finishing his count of the rows. What we don't see must be in the hangar. It would have been dangerous for anything to fly in or out of the base said Jackson. The storms blasting the area are quite violent. We're lucky we got a partial break in them on this pass. It looks like the base has been secured to ride out the storms. No activity. What have you heard from the ER team? Nothing since you crashed out down the hall. They must have finished something by now. Contact them. Let's see what they have, Torin responded. Located at the back of the Strategic Reconnaissance Office, the Refinement and Enhancement Team was squeezed in next to the Tactical Team. For the last several hours, ever since they received the data from the initial pass, they had been quietly busy. They strained, divided, and reconstructed the images until they had something that could be identified. This looks familiar, Jackson commented pointing to the helicopter appearing in the next series of refined shots. It's the Python gunship that appeared to have landed hard. Looks like it had a reason to, said Torin, grabbing one of the console's headsets. ER, this is Torin. Do you have any enhancements of quadrants 57 through 63? Yes, Colonel. We'll put them up now, said the team leader. A few seconds later, the spine of the Python 100's tail boom appeared in exacting detail. The images ran from where the boom attached to the fuselage back to the midpoint, where the irregular patterns of buckled and rent open outer skin panels ended. That doesn't look like any kind of damage you'd get on a training exercise, Jackson noted. It's what you get when armor-piercing cannon shells explode against Kevlar, said Torin. It's battle damage. From what I recall of the gun camera recordings from Roswell, I think we could match the helicopter with one of those involved in the attack. I think we have our ident. Does that mean we can go off duty? Weber asked, eagerly and incautiously. Not yet, Lieutenant. Not by a long shot. 
Torin's withering look was laser hot and seemingly melted the junior officer into his console. I need as complete an identification of this machine as we've done in the past, before I'll take it up the line to the command staff. We've had a long night, Colonel, said Jackson, rubbing her eyes. Not to mention a long day before it. I know, said Torin, glancing at the office's chronometer and mildly surprised at the time it displayed. Even though we've all had a couple of hours in the crash quarters, it has been long. I promise this won't take much more time. I can have our relief crew arrive soon. And if we don't finish identifying this gunship, they'll do it for us. Then it goes up the line. Who's this coming? Said Shacker, pointing to yet another vehicle approaching the base cemetery. Some of the Air Force fighter jacks, said Hunter. They tried to track down the remaining Bauhaus choppers, but their radars were jammed, and the choppers stuck to the floor until they reached the border. These guys were good, and our pilots respect them. Yeah, it's a damn sure bet there won't be many people from security attending this service, said Benetti. More than a dozen Capital Air Force pilots and their weapon systems officers joined the Special Forces personnel and the Tri-Service Military Honor Guard, already in the cemetery. They had all just finished introducing themselves when a small convoy of trucks finally arrived at the lushly planted, somber location. There's something about a cemetery, Julia remarked as she stepped off the lead truck. No matter how they landscape it, it always manages to feel like one. Did the Brotherhood missionaries perform their rituals at the hospital? Asked Hunter. Yes, then they gave the bodies over to our keeping, and now it's time for ours. At Hunter's signal, the honor guard came to attention, and part of it marched up to the trucks. One by one, they gently offloaded the lozenge-shaped metal coffins and laid them in perfect rows in front of a freshly excavated mass grave. The assembled guests snapped to attention when the first arrived and remained so until Alvarez and Hunter joined them. Fellow officers and soldiers, Julia began once Hunter ordered everyone to at ease. We gather here today to honor our adversaries dead in the hopes that should we fall in similar circumstances, we'll be accorded the same rights I will now recite. The Air Warriors farewell. You've flown your last mission you fought your last battle, and your orders are to slip these bonds that hold you to the earth, and dance the skies on laughter's silvered wings. Sunward you climb to join the tumult of sun-split clouds and footless halls of air, where you can do all the things you have only dreamed of. Wheel, arc, and climb up the wind-swept heights you soar, where never hawk or even eagle flew. And with silent, lifting mind, you slip to the untrespassed sanctity of space. Put out your hands and touch the face of God. We are but born human and can only hope to die that way. We give you your final salute and bid you your last farewell. When Alvarez finished, the honor guard's arm section pulled the bolts back on their rifles simultaneously and snapped them forward. They raised the weapons to their shoulders and fired a series of volleys while everyone else came to attention and saluted. As the last ripple of explosions echoed in the distance, Alvarez stepped forward and laid a dollar coin in a shallow well on the first coffin's lid. The remaining attendees repeated the ceremony until all the coffins bore the same symbolic payment for burial. Only then did the honor guard lead the procession out to the parking lot where it would disband. I'm glad the lieutenant didn't carry on too long, said Halston, marching directly behind Hunter, or else she would have sounded like a damn Brotherhood missionary or mystic. That'll be enough, Sergeant, Hunter warned, turning his head just far enough to look over his shoulder. Wendy, 
You got anything to say about last night? Yes, we'd better meet at Tim's apartment later, said Levine, speaking in a softer than normal voice so only the squad could hear her. Our search was very successful and very disturbing. I... I mean no disrespect, Master Ragathal. The heretic quickly and nervously replied. But Lord Algaroth has taken great interest in your activities. I... I have journeyed through the worlds of man to deliver his message to you. The receptacle of visions has taken an increased importance in his plans, and he wishes to know your progress in recapturing her. Progress. As of yet, there's been no progress, said Bregathal, making predatory circles around the newly arrived heretic. The human organizations keep stealing her from each other, and each time we must track her down and create plans for her recapture. I understand your frustration, Master Ragathal. Understand? You understand nothing. What am I master of here? This is Azeroth's citadel, his domain. I am but master of an operation. I must go begging to him for every resource I need. This is growing more humiliating than I had reckoned. Yes, Shagul, what is it you wish? Ragathal turned to the hulking form which had suddenly appeared in the entrance of his nether room. As he motioned with his uninjured arm, the lead Tekron silently entered and bowed respectfully to his master. For a few seconds, they both ignored the trembling heretic. As the giant worker opened his mind to the Nephorite and allowed him to probe his thoughts. Indeed, our minions have been successful much faster than I had thought, said Ragathal, smiling at first. Then he broke into a blood chilling laugh, which echoed through the main chamber of his nether room. Inform Ekmerias and Kalikabal of this and have them report here. We must complete our preparations to steal the receptacle of visions back. Now for you, messenger, journey back through the worlds of man and report to Lord Algaroth that the human female has been found, and this time will act too swiftly for her to be stolen by anyone else. Leave me now. I wish to enjoy the serenity of this moment. Okay, is that going to be everyone? Small asked after Harris and Taylor slipped into his apartment. Yeah, Rogers won't be joining us, said Hunter. He's kissing up to Hart and his staff at the dinner tonight. That doesn't surprise me. Even though Raymond does remind me more of me than anyone else in your squad. While he spoke, Small pulled an old model sonic disruptor out of a desk drawer and sat it on his living room table. He dialed in a radius roughly equal to the room's area and activated it. Anyone outside the disruptor field would hear an unintelligible mumble and a static buzz. He made sure his telephone, television, and various radios stayed outside the radius. And as a final security measure, he attached a motion detector to the front door. You know, Tim, they make portable models of these things, said Alvarez, pointing to the saucer-shaped disruptor. The Cybertronic ones are especially good. And really expensive, Small countered. Besides, I like being a dinosaur. Now the disruptor will cover only this room, not the kitchen, bedroom, storage room, or bathroom. So don't carry any conversations from here into one of them. What I have to tell you is for your ears only. What's got you spooked? said Hunter, after nodding in agreement. You're acting like a Cybertronic infiltrator is on your tail. Believe me, I think I prefer one of them to what may be really out there. Uniquely, instead of turning to his personal computer and calling up a file, 
Small produced a series of printed out sheets and handwritten notes from his attaché case. Your kidnapped VIP was nothing of the kind. She was an anemic picked up by spaceport security after being alerted by the crew of ISS space liner Copernicus. She boarded or was put on board the liner at its Luna stop. However, if you think she's from Luna, she's not. Her name is Lorraine Coven, a married mother of two children, a member of one of Capital's smaller agricultural settlements, and a lifelong resident of Venus. She has never been to any other world, and there's no record of her recently leaving the planet. In fact, the last record I could find of her prior to being picked up at Atlantis was a ground forces report. It listed her as missing and presumed dead when her village was attacked and massacred by an unknown force. Miss Coven is apparently the only known survivor of the attack, and Wendy knows her examination by the doctors had just begun when Bauhaus kidnapped her. It's probably Bauhaus who attacked the village, Vanetti suggested, and they kidnapped her to silence her. If Bauhaus wanted to silence her, they would have sent an assassination team said Hunter. Not a major commando strike group of air cavalry and Venusian rangers. Perhaps it was Mishima, said Shacker, studying one of Small's printouts. The settlement was closer to slant territory than anyone else's. It'd be just like the slants to sneak up and wipe out everyone. Then why was this woman left alive? Taylor asked. And why would Bauhaus help them? Don't be a fool, man. Bauhaus hates Mishima even more than you do. Corporate politics have made stranger alliances. Even Cybertronic and the Brotherhood have cooperated. None of you are even hitting close to the mark, said Wendy. It's the Dark Legion. Her quiet voice cut through the more raucous conversation like a knife. They stuttered to a halt, and a few even laughed but in seconds, the room was silent. You mean the little green aliens? Said Julia, incredulous. The boogeyman? Sure, we've all heard of them. The Brotherhood talks about nothing else. And we all know the story of the Nero disaster. But have any of us actually seen one of these creatures? Or even a heretic? I have, Small answered, cutting short the nervous laughter. The work I've done for the Brotherhood has brought me into contact with those claiming allegiance with the Legion. Those who claim? There are nuts out there who claim to own a majority of capital stock. Julia's response rapidly grew more mocking and strident. She even tried to laugh. I want more proof than the crazed mutterings of those in need of a psych adjustment. If it's proof you want, Lieutenant, I'll give you some, Sir Wendy her quiet voice growing cold. While Tim was raiding the hospital's protected files, I was analyzing them. The medical and psychological reports of Lorraine Coven carried an eyes-only secrecy rating. I've never seen that level on anyone's medical report, not even a major stockholder's. And what they detail is a form of chemical mind alteration unlike anything anyone's ever even attempted before. A literal brainwashing. The doctors were surprised Miss Coven was still alive, and reports suggested nothing of her original memory exists. So she's a zombie? The walking brain dead? asked Halston. No, there are higher function brain activities, all right. The doctors think it was some sort of artificial memory that's literally been programmed into her brain then she's the victim of some Bauhaus mind control experiment, said Alvarez. No wonder they want her back so badly. No, Lieutenant. What was done to Mrs. Coven is beyond every megacorp's medical technology, said Wendy. We're talking about restructuring the human brain. In our ancient history, we once compared it to a mechanical watch, and for centuries now, we've likened it to a digital computer. Neither analogy is true. The brain is far more complex than anything it can build. However, 
A report based on evidence gathered by the Brotherhood indicates an alien science called necrotechnology can literally wash and reprogram the human brain. Uh, you had me, but you lost me. Now you're talking about things out of some dark fantasy movie? No offense, Julia, but I happen to believe that something alien and evil was uncovered out there on Nero, Taylor interrupted. But it was always out there. Maybe it reached as far as the moons of Jupiter or even the asteroid belt, but here? This far? Into the solar system? You haven't said much so far. Small noted, turning to Hunter. Are you willing to believe, Mitch, or are you eager to dismiss? The military has always been a society unto itself, said Hunter, and special forces is an especially insulated world. This is one of those times I wish I were a freelancer roaming the streets of the Luna cities. I'd be much more in touch with what's really happening in the real world and can tell if what we're listening to is spook stories or rumors or the real thing. No, I'll not dismiss what we've just been told, but I'd like some more information about it. Tim, can you arrange a meeting with your Brotherhood contacts? If you want it, sure, but it may take a little while to set up, though. Don't worry, I have plenty of other things to keep us busy. You mean your rescue operation? said Alvarez. That and something else. Hunter answered, paging through the notes and printouts of Small's report. Bauhaus took Mrs. Coven because they obviously thought she was valuable. Perhaps she's also valuable to the Dark Legion. She could be just as dangerous to possess. Perhaps in addition to planning on rescuing her, we should also make plans to warn Bauhaus about the threat from the Dark Legion. Not only would it be illegal, Captain, said Benetti, but I think the Duke Electors in Hamburg would laugh your warning right off the comnet. It doesn't hurt to think about it. I'd like to have as many options open to us as possible. It'll save us from being stuck on one course of action. What makes you think Venus Command will use your squad for the rescue? Asked Small. The guys who came in before you told me what you did to that idiot advisor. You should be up on insubordination charges. You could be demoted or kicked right out of the military for it. I know, said Hunter looking up from the report, but I haven't really been charged yet, and my unit is still on active duty, so there's a chance we'll be selected. All right, I want everyone to go over the material and to memorize as much of it as you can. No photocopies or computer copies will be made of any of it. This is our own private operation, and no one needs to know anything about it. You're not even to discuss it with anyone outside of the people you see here. Drone Nagato, change to course 181 degrees on my mark and change to terrain following mode. Proceed on the new course for 100 kilometers before pop-up and evasion. Return maneuvers to original course. Mark, mark, mark. Mishima Trooper. Momoko Watanabe watched on her tactical screen as one of the warhead reconnaissance drones she had airborne responded to her new orders. After skirting the unofficial frontier to Dark Legion territory since its launch, it now deviated sharply from its preset patrol pattern. It flew toward the frontier and dropped to the deck. Following the contours of the jungle-covered terrain, the drone's sudden change was in response to a dramatic increase in electrical emissions from a site called the Citadel. Drone Yamoto, increase altitude to 5,000 meters, Momoko ordered while she studied the status panel to the other drone she had airborne. Reduce the airspeed by 60% and a change to holding pattern alpha on my mark. Analyze a hostile electrical emissions in conjunction with Nagato's maneuver. Mark. Mark, Mark, computer analysis of the latest hostile emissions. 
As with most of her other watch tours, Momoko staffed the outpost observation tower alone. She sat before its immense communications and control console, monitoring the activities of the warhead drones she had airborne and the outpost's electronic surveillance systems. In addition to covering the frontier with capital, she also watched a remote area occupied by the Dark Legion. It was in territory contested by both Capital and Mishima. It did not usually occupy much of her time. Lately, however, the times were unusual, and most of her tours were spent recording all activities at the distant Citadel. For a few moments, her tactical computer silently worked on its analysis of the newest transmissions from the Citadel. When it finished, the analysis was displayed on one of her console's data screens. 98% probability that emissions were of an area surveillance air traffic control radar last detected at 1953 hours. Duration was 2 minutes 30 seconds, an increase in 60% over transmission time. End analysis. Momoko immediately realized what was happening. The Citadel was preparing to launch either aircraft or a spacecraft, and she had just enough time to prepare for it. Drone Nagato, emergency cancellation order Archimedes, she said. Maintain current terrain following mode and heading. Reduce speed by 30%. Prepare for evasive maneuvers and return to original course and position on my mark. Even though her first drone's speed had dropped to less than 200 miles an hour, it would reach the Citadel's outer defense perimeter in a matter of minutes. Though its stealth properties and tiny radar signature would probably allow it to escape detection. It would be deeper inside restricted territory than officially allowed by Mishima Military Command. However, the drone never even closed to proximity warning distance of the perimeter before activity at the Citadel jumped dramatically. The outpost's long-range radar detected the liftoff from its Spartan surface facility of slow-moving aircraft. They circled the location just long enough to join formation, then headed northwest at increasing speed. Drone Nagato, change to intercept course of hostile formation, Momoko ordered. Maintain current terrain following mode until safe distance from a formation, then climb to 1,000 meter and maintain surveillance. Drone Yamamoto, change to intercept course of hostile formation and maintain surveillance at number of safe distance. Execute all commands on my mark. 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 In unison, both machines broke away from their previous headings and closed on the distant formation of unidentified aircraft. Even though Watanabe soon ordered the Nagato warhead to increase speed, its closure rate was still far slower than the Yamamoto's, mostly because it continued to hug the increasingly rugged terrain the formation was crossing. They're not just airplanes, they're helicopters, said Momoko, studying the warhead's initial sensor scans. Computer, analyze Nakato and Yamamoto data and identify aircraft types. The formation was still more than 50 miles from either drone, but already they were scanning it with their sensor arrays and transmitting the data back to the outpost. Seconds later, the computer's analysis of it all appeared on the same auxiliary screen. Hostile formation consists of three MMAT-3 Kyoko assault transports and five MLRG-15 Hayabusa helicopter gunships. External configurations of aircraft has been altered, but not severe enough for them to be unrecognizable. End analysis. Line drawings of the two Mishima warplanes appeared next to the data screen and the backup one below it. The formation of Kyoko's transport had their familiar boxy fuselage, triple tail fins, and short span wings with tip mounted turboprop engines. But there were also the melted deformations, the thorn and spike shaped projections that told Watanabe she was looking at dark technology corrupted ships. The Hayabusa long range gunship bore similar alterations to what had been a slim, streamlined fuselage with only the belly-mounted gun turret to mar its clean design. 
Yet, in both aircraft, the corruptions were not as extensive as what she had seen on Bauhaus and Capital-designed weapons. And this time, because the sighting involved stolen Mishima aircraft, she felt her superiors would not mind if she bent the surveillance rules a little. John Yamamoto, increase speed by 20% and close to optimum observation distance, said Momoko, studying the tactical screen and the original time to intercept flashing beside the symbol for her second drone. Prepare for evasive maneuvers if threatened during surveillance. Execute on my mark, 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 mark. The moment the drone received its new orders, it was accelerating and changing course slightly to make the quickest interception. Once it reached the optimal distance, it would no longer be necessary to observe the Dark Legion formation through radar and infrared systems. It could do so with its optical system and might be able to read any unit markings still on the aircraft. As I had hoped, said Momoko, studying yet another screen on her immense console. Computer, run analysis of partial Sentai markings on the third Kyoko trance. A light started flashing atop the tactical screen, and the blaring alert horn caused Momoko to almost jump out of her seat. It was all superfluous. She could already see what triggered the alarms. The two Hayabusa gunships on the formation's starboard side had broken away and were closing on the warhead. Draw near Momoto. Immediate evasive maneuvers, she shouted. The second airborne drone had just finished rolling on its side and was diving for the jungle when the gunships opened fire. It tried to dive under them, but their gun turrets continued to track and snap out short bursts, even when fully depressed. The inhuman crews worked closely with each other, almost as if one mind were directing them. It did not take many hits for them to disable the drone. Soon, it was spiraling out of control. Instead of just maneuvering frantically, Drone Yamamoto, emergency cancellation order, Archimedes, said Momoko as the other warhead crashed through the thick jungle canopy and exploded. Execute evasive and escape program on my mark, 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 mark. With some satisfaction, she watched her remaining airborne drone end its intercept course with a Dark Legion formation and swing back for the frontier. She then ordered the outpost computers to timeline all events for the last 30 minutes in preparation for a report she would send to her superiors before her watch ended. Perhaps now they would take her warnings about the Dark Legion more seriously, and maybe they would at last send the additional reconnaissance drones and personnel she repeatedly claimed the outpost needed. Mutant Chronicles Fiction The Apostle of Insanity Trilogy Volume 2 Frenzy by John Allen Price Chapter 6 End